you know, stem cells, as you know, generally are derived, you know, from an embryo. Right. Uh, and that has been certainly like very difficult uh, to do studies. But then about... We're certainly politically fraught with issues related to the ethics of using human, human embryos. Right. And, and that was a big issue until you guys figured out, or your people figured out, how to create stem cells without- Out of regular that, cells. Out of regular cells. So this is- well, the, That happened 20 years ago, mm -hmm. almost wow. 20 years ago, 19 years ago, uh, when a Japanese scientist, uh, Shinya Yamanaka, made this like breakthrough discovery where he actually showed that you could actually turn any cell that we have in our body mm -hmm. that is already differentiated. So like back in time to look like those embryonic stem cells. And so almost like a, you know, sort of like cellular alchemy, so to speak, right? Because it was like, we always thought that it's a one-way street. Uh, development is a one-way street. You never sort of like go back. Just so we're on the same page, stem cells, while it's always in the news, just as a reminder to the non-biologist, it is a kind of cell that you, under the right conditions, can turn into any other cell of the human body. Is that correct? Exactly. Yeah, it has nerve cells, muscle cells. Yeah, and and that's why they're prevalent in the embryo because the embryo is manufacturing the all the, the, the cells. All the cells, right? Okay, exactly. Gotcha. Well, stem cells have have two properties: they can turn into any other cells, and they can renew themselves, so they can stay as stem cells for a very long time. And of course, there are multiple levels of stem cells. The first ones are the ones that are the most powerful; they can turn into everything. And then as you progress in development, they become more and more restricted in what they can do. But the ones that are really in the beginning uh, are you know, the ones that you would like to have so that you can ultimately guide them to become different other cells and tissues in, in the body. Wait, so you put them in a time machine. Is that that box that's sitting behind you? <laughs> <laughs> so you, you say that, but how, how is that possible? How, how are you able to take a brain cell that you've cultured and dial it back? to a stem cell and then bring it into whichever area you need to bring it to. So it was it's really a, a brilliant idea uh, that build on work that was done before. And uh, essentially the experiment was like very simply done. He just looked at the main genes that are expressed in the stem cells. And then he said, let's see which ones are really important. So he took them and he put them in a, actually in the skin cell, took a skin cell, and starting putting various combinations of those genes that are very strongly present in those stem cells. And through this combinatorial you know, experiment, he found out four, that if you put at the same time, you know, pretty much you know, confuse the cell, so to speak, and the cell becomes reprogrammed. That's why we call it cell reprogramming, because the cell is really reprogrammed to that state. And it turns out that they have all the properties of those embryonic stem cells, but you can make them from anybody in a non-invasive way. And of course you can store them, you can ship them to others. And so that was really a, a breakthrough for the field because that opened up the possibility for the first time that you could get stem cells from anybody, from any patient, and then start to study it uh, in addition. I was finishing my clinical training around that time and really to a large extent like dropped everything because my uh, expertise, I'm a physician by training, my expertise is actually autism spectrum disorders and neurodevelopmental conditions. And I was like incredibly frustrated by the lack of models to study this disease. We, you know, there are animal models, but you know, what is an animal model of autism, right? I mean, that has been so like a, a challenging aspect. We can't really access the human brain, right? I mean, that is sort of like the, you know, this curse, this unbearable inaccessibility of the human brain. I mean, it's behind the skull and unlike any other organ, you can't just like go there, get a biopsy and study it. So we were sort of like blocked, so to speak, locked into this state where we couldn't really make progress. And uh, yeah, so about, you know, 16, 17 years ago, I, I came to Stanford, mesmerized by the so like potential of this uh, stem cells that we can make, which we called induced pluripotent stem cells. And they started thinking, could we actually turn them into neurons from patients and then study whatever defects are characteristic of that disease, but outside of the human body. And that's really what enabled, uh, uh, you know, all of this. And initially- So that blew open the whole field at that point. Yeah, exactly. They opened the whole field. And, you know, in the beginning, just to make it clear, it was, you know, re I mean, I got all the grants and all the fellowships rejected all the time as this being absolutely insane. You know, like, how can you actually like make neurons in a dish and then even expect to find something from a disease that is so mysterious, right? Think about, I mean, autism 
is a complex disease of social behavior. What are you going to see actually in the dish? Yeah. So, I mean, we'll get back probably to this conversation, but it was actually key for us to focus on a disease where we actually like knew what to expect, sort of like to calibrate. And that sort of like started the, uh, you know, this entire journey. And in the beginning, most of these experiments were very simple. You know, you would take the stem cells from patients uh, that we derive in a dish and then kind of like spike in various molecules in a dish. Uh, so like guide them to try to become neurons. And those differentiation experiments were like uh, easy, but then... About 10 years ago, it became clear that we're going to need more of the three-dimensional aspect of development to really capture even more complex features of the brain. And that's how some of these 3D cultures, which are now known as organoids, appear first.